Your presence here this evening obviously uh, makes clear um, your interest in the letter to the Romans and, and your commitment to scripture and, and to scripture study. As you know, um, the church's le uh, daily lectionary cycles through many books of the Bible on a regular basis. And coincidentally, this past Monday, we began reading Paul's letter to the Romans as part of the daily cycle. So those of you who use that as, as prayer, um, this is a perfect, perfect opportunity, perfect time to be, uh, to be studying about it. And so let me take a moment uh, to introduce our, um, our speaker uh, to you. Um, a member of the Wisconsin province of the Society of Jesus, Father Thomas Stegman is dean of the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, as well as associate professor of New Testament in the ecclesiastical faculty. His love for the Bible was a seed planted early in life um, as his mother read to him from Children's Illustrated Bible. Uh, and as he grew older, he uh, was struck by how important the Bible was to his uh, non-Catholic Christian friends. And so he began to, to look at it more, um, more carefully. Um, Father Stegman holds an MA from Marquette University, a Master's of Divinity degree and Licentia in Sacred Theology, uh, Old Testament, uh, from Weston uh, Jesuit School of Theology, um, and a, a PhD in New Testament Studies from Emory University, uh, where he worked under the direction of, uh, Luke, of Dr. Luke Timothy Johnson. Father Stegman is the recipient of many academic awards, including the uh, American Bible Society Scholarly Achievement Award and the Aquinas Institute Fellowship at Emory University. He held the Reverend Francis C. Wade uh, Chair at Marquette University in 2010 and the Ann and Donald Waite uh, Endowed Chair in Jesuit Education at Creighton University in 2014-15. He has published widely uh, and is the author of two books on 2 Corinthians, including uh, a volume in the series Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. Um, Father Stegman is co-editor of the Paulus Biblical Commentary, which is a single volume commentary designed especially for those engaged in pastoral ministry. And that's going to be published in 2018. So we'll be gathering here again in the fall of 2018 to talk about uh, the resources that that, um, that, that uh, provides, provides for us. In addition, he's the author of uh, Opening the Door of Faith, Encountering Jesus and His Call to Discipleship, and his newly published book, uh, Written for Our Instruction, Theology and Spirituality in Paul's Letters, which was just published by Paulus Press. Um, both of those titles are available at the back uh, table. And you might want to think about picking up your copy of Written for Our Instruction, because in the spring, right after uh, Easter, we'll be offering an online course using that book as the primary text to look even more deeply at the, um, the, the book of Romans. So um, get your book now. It's on, it's on sale. <laughs> really. This is the time to get it. Writing for the Midwest Jesuit newsletter, Father Stegman noted, as I think about my life, I marvel at the journey on which God has led me. From a small town in south central Nebraska to teaching Jesuits, other religious and lay students who come from all parts of the world preparing for various forms of ministry in the church. What I try to inculcate most in my students is a love and reverence for God's word in scripture, which leads to a love and reverence for Jesus. Love and reverence for scripture and Jesus, how can we do better in a New Testament scholar? So please join me in welcoming Father Tom Stegman. Thank you, Jane, and thank you for uh, plugging the book. My mother wanted me to tell you that the books back there make good stocking stuffers, so you might keep that in mind uh, this evening. Um, I'm very excited about this uh, opportunity to share with you um, some of the things I've discovered over time in, in uh, reading Paul and, and praying over him and studying him. Uh, this book actually came out of an uh, experience. I was writing a commentary on the letter to the Romans. And uh, you, you find out how disciplined you are when you write a commentary because um, the next thing is right in front of you. The, the next paragraph is the next verse. You, you just have to keep slogging away. 
Um, and as I was working on the, the letter sequentially, it struck me that it's kind of easy to start losing uh, some of the uh, forest for the trees. And uh, so I, as I was writing that commentary, I started working on some essays uh, that encapsulated some of the theological and spiritual themes, and, and that became the fruits of, of this book. Uh, now, I'm not gonna talk so much about the book itself, except uh, to tell you a little bit about the title, because it informs really why I'm doing what I'm doing, and also why I wrote the book. Um, but since some of you are buying the book, I'm not gonna ask you to double dip. You can read the book. <laughs> um, I'll, I, I wanna go a little bit diff in a different direction. So, so why the title? Um, written for our instruction. I steal most of the things I, I use, and, and here I steal uh, the title from words that Paul himself uses in chapter 15, verse four. And the context here is Paul is exhorting the Christians in Rome to live in such a way that they're edifying or building one another up, and especially in areas uh, that could be contentious. And reading between the lines, uh, we can see that this is a community that is, consists of Jews and Gentiles who are trying to come together, and questions of what is the proper food to eat, um, what feast days do we celebrate, uh, these were points of difference, and it didn't just fall along uh, the lines of Jews and Christians, there were, or Jews and Gentiles, I'm sorry. Uh, some of the Gentile believers uh, were so attracted to Judaism that um, becoming Christians, they wanted to follow some of the, the Jewish practices. But think about this, that what is it that's really essential to our lives as, as Christians is table fellowship and worship. And so when there's questions about these differences, they can divide the community. And Paul was really wanting uh, the members of the community, especially those who have more robust conscience, to not so much insist upon their theological correctness, but to act in love. And that's the context in which this quotation comes. He says, we who are strong, and notice that you never hear anyone say, I'm on the side of the weak. It's the ones who are talking there, they always associate themselves with the strong. But Paul says, we who are strong ought to bear, now your translation might say with the failings of the weak, that's a bad translation. Paul, the weak don't fail. He says, we ought to bear with the weaknesses or the in effect, the, the spiritual uh, immaturity of the weak, and not seek to please ourselves, not to put our agenda at the forefront. He says, let each of us please our neighbor for their good, to strive to edify, to build them up. Why? He says, because Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, now he quotes scripture, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now that's not obvious what's going on at first blanche, but um, this is a citation from Psalm 69. And if you read all of Psalm 69, it tells the story of a righteous sufferer, of one whose commitment to God and God's ways leads him or her to opposition and suffering. And the person cries out to God and God vindicates the suffering of those who are faithful. Paul s read that psalm and said, boy, this sounds an awful lot like what God did through Christ. Paul tended to read the psalms Christologically. So he reads the psalm as supporting his claim that this is the way that Christ lived, not to please himself, but to uh, give himself for others. And that's how he wants the Romans to live. So the text about something that happened years ago, this psalmist experience. Paul says, no, that was, that's written about Christ. And moreover, that story pertains to us, to Paul and the Roman Christians. He says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might be people of hope. Um, so my basic thesis here is that the letter to the Romans, which was written 2,000 years ago, to uh, a distinct group of people for specific purposes, yes, it was written to them, but as sacred scripture, as part of our New Testament canon, Paul's words were written for our instruction as well. So that's my 
hermeneutical or interpretive uh, key here. Um, I want to say a word. The, the, the uh, cover of the book, if I may say, is beautiful. I wish I could take credit for it. Um, the previous book I did with Paulist, Opening the Door of Faith, I was actually consulted about the cover. Why do you want on the cover? And I said, well, could we have like doors opening up and then there's also this notion of a journey of faith and we have to have a destination. And I kept describing this and the people were looking at me like, you really don't know anything about graphics, do you? This way, way too busy. And so um, they didn't bother asking me about this cover, but I must say it's exactly what I would have, would have wanted. So you have to know your limits um, and mine are many, believe me. Um, let me say a few words about why I wrote the book and why I'm passionate about Paul. Um, Jane mentioned the uh, lectionary cycle. Um, I'd like to reflect with you a few minutes about how we Catholics read the scripture and what part of the scripture we um, tend to favor. And when I talk about a canon within a canon, that's what I'm talking about. What parts of scripture um, are most important to us, that inform our way of living. And in saying this, there's no critique intended. Um, all of us have our go-to texts, right? So think of our practice in, in liturgy, and particularly on Sundays. After Vatican II, the lectionary was revised to a three-year cycle. And each year, we read through one of the synoptic gospels. This particular year, we're working through Matthew's gospel. Uh, John's Gospel then gets read in Christmas and uh, Lent and Easter. Um, so we read the Gospel, and we read it in a semi-continuous way. We get pretty good chunks uh, this year of Matthew's Gospel. The first reading, which is an Old Testament text, is chosen in light of what the Gospel passage is. And the, the first reading is oftentimes setting up the Gospel passage. It might serve as a uh, anticipatory uh, way of expressing what happens. The gospel might be set up as a contrast. It might be set up in the form of a prophecy that's fulfilled. The, the Old Testament reading is linked somehow to the gospel reading. The second reading, which often, most often comes from Paul, is on its own cycle. So these last four weeks, we've been working our way pretty quickly to, through Philippians, and starting next Sunday, We'll have five weeks of First Thessalonians. But over a three-year period, we go through the, the Pauline corpus. But they're not uh, thematically linked. For preachers, this can be a challenge. And Catholics tend to like crisp homilies. <laughs> Seven minutes is plenty. Or, yeah. right? So for a homilist, it can be challenging to incorporate the Pauline text because uh, we tend to focus on the gospel, but also think of, think of how we behave at the liturgy. First reading, second reading, we're seated. A lector reads, proclaims the uh, lectionary selection, says the word of the Lord, we say thanks be to God. But after the second reading, what do we do? Now we start singing alleluia. We stand up. Oftentimes, we had a beautiful liturgy today at uh, St. Ignatius. It was our all-school liturgy at School of Theology and Ministry, um, we have a fancy book of the Gospels and it gets held up. Um, and then it's an ordained person. It's not always the Pope who reads. It can be a deacon, mere deacon or a priest. Um, but think of how just that very uh, way of breaking open the word uh, says that we Catholics tend to favor the life of Jesus, or the Gospels, because they set forth the fundamental story of Jesus. And as disciples called to imitate Jesus and hearing the stories of Jesus and his disciples, that makes a lot of sense, okay? Um, but the downside is we don't, while we hear Paul, we often don't learn a lot about Paul. Second, reading, uh, second reason I was interested in writing something on Paul in a more popular way was, as I was doing this, we were celebrating uh, the Year of Mercy, which Pope Francis promulgated. And if you read his, um, the bull that announced that, the very first biblical quotation is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, with its reference to God's being rich in mercy. 
as I look at the Pope's uh, writings, he makes uh, tremendous and, and uh, substantial use of scripture and all of scripture. Um, he oftentimes cites the gospels, but I'm struck by how much he cites the Pauline texts as well. And I would commend to your reading, uh, if you haven't looked th uh, through Amoris Laetitia, or even if you have, uh, go over paragraphs 90 to 119 again. He has a beautiful homiletic exposition of 1 Corinthians uh, 13, uh, the famous uh, uh, encomium on love. Uh, so I'm convinced that uh, Pope Francis is largely informed by Paul, and uh, therefore I think we should be more attracted to it. Third reason for writing is I took that picture in class yesterday. I was one of our students during great <laughs> themes. <laughs> It was when I was teaching, when Dick Clifford teaches, they, there's, everything is clear, but when I'm teaching, they start scratching their heads. Um, it's an interesting line in scripture from 2 Peter, which is the latest uh, of the documents written in the New Testament. Uh, that's basically universally agreed by New Testament scholars. Probably dates early to the second century. It's pretty apparent the Pauline uh, corpus is being collected and being read and studied, and the author of 2 Peter says there are some things in Paul's letters hard to understand. Probably the biggest understatement in the New Testament. <laughs> I think we can all relate to that. Paul's letters are hard to read. They intimidate people. First of all, he doesn't tell stories, right? In Gospels, he gets stories. So uh, the genre of the epistle can be challenging. But Paul uses a lot of words that we're not familiar with and a lot of words that, quite frankly, are difficult uh, to translate in ways that I think capture Paul's meaning but still respect uh, English. And we're going to have a few examples of that. Uh, I think Paul intimidates people. I think people can have misconceptions about Paul. He seems kind of... Um, obsessed with suffering, he's, he's focusing on the cross all the time. He describes his own ministry as uh, caring about in the body the very putting to death of Jesus, being handed over an account of Jesus. Uh, sometimes Paul can sound uh, defensive. What, am I not an apostle? He says to the second Corinthians, or to uh, the Corinthians in second Corinthians, he says, haven't I seen the Lord? Um, Paul, as we know, was not one of the 12. And his apostolic credentials were called into question by some. Um, he can come off as uh, being kind of bossy. Uh, and according to some, um, he, some of his texts can sound misogynist, uh, although I don't think that's the right reading of Paul. Perhaps in our Q&A, we can, we can come back to that. So those were some of the reasons I, I wanted to write the text, to make Paul uh, uh, more accessible. So in terms of what I'd like to do with you is I want to focus a little bit on the conversion of, uh, of Paul because uh, this is really the event in his life that, that um, set him on a new course. But I think it really is what gave him the insights that over time he developed and, and uh, set forth in his writings uh, where he experienced God's mercy, where he came to understand how uh, God's mercy was paradoxically manifested through the cross of Jesus and where he experienced God's uh, reconciling love and uh, the gift of the Spirit. Okay. Um, if you read the text closely, and, and, and the texts uh, that describe uh, Paul's conversion are found in the Acts of the Apostles, so uh, not from Paul's hand. Paul refers to this event uh, a few times in his writings where he talks about seeing the Lord. Um, there's actually a number of, I would say, allusions to this, and I'll share some of those with you as I, as I set forth what I think was going on. Uh, but I just want to make a comment. First of all, any time I get a chance to show Caravaggio, I think it's a great excuse to do so. Um, there's no mention of a horse. I remember as a kid, somebody, you know, when you find out there's no Santa Claus and your world's kind of changed a little bit. I remember this Jesuit uh, telling me years ago that, you know, there's no horse in the story of St. Paul's conversion, and I looked in the text, and sure enough, there's, there isn't any mention of a horse. He does fall down, but he could fall down walking. But I, think, I would say that uh, it's fair to say that after Caravaggio, there has to be a horse. Uh, that's so <laughs> incredible, and, and, and there should be a, a horse. Um, what's going on? Why was, Paul, why was Paul doing what he was doing at this moment? Because this 
event happened in the course of Paul persecuting Christians, or uh, Christ believers. And I'm going to qualify this uh, in a second. Paul tells us in uh, Philippians 3, uh, one of the things I have to tell my students is uh, we don't learn a lot about Paul, Paul's biography from his writings. Um, and that's a fact worth thinking about itself, especially those of us who preach and teach. Uh, Paul is too busy wanting to talk about Jesus. He doesn't talk about himself a lot, and that might be a good lesson for those of us in the teaching and preaching ministry. Um, but one place where Paul does set forth something about his, his life uh, before his encounter with the risen Christ is in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 4 and following. I just want to read this text and, and uh, walk through it with you. Paul says, if any other person thinks he has reason for confidence in his past, in, in, in his accomplishments. Paul says, I have more. Yeah. Paul's very sanguine. He says, um, circumcised on the eighth day. This is what good Jews did. He was brought up in a devout, practicing Jewish family. Uh, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin and Judah were the two tribes, uh, the southern tribes that were not part of the um, um, deportation of the northern tribes. These were the ones who were... Uh, um, deported to Babylon, but came back. And uh, you probably don't spend a lot of time reading Ezra and Nehemiah, but if you want to get a taste of a flavor for what, uh, where Paul's coming from, when the Jews came back from exile, they really circled the wagons and said, we, we were exiled because we were unfaithful to God. We're going to be super, super faithful to God. And Paul says, this is the stock from which I come, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. Uh, perhaps Paul spoke or he certainly knew Hebrew. Did he speak it? Um, that's, uh, that's argued. Here's what the, what's important. As to the law of Pharisee. As to the law of Pharisee. Now, Pharisees get a bad rap. We had a gospel today in which Jesus is, is criticizing the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, but I want to paint the Pharisees in a more favorable light. Uh, think of the adjective pharisaical. When you think of that, what comes to mind? Yeah, uh, it may be hypocritical or, or stuck on the letter of the law, uh, self-righteous, okay? Um, but that's a caricature of the Pharisees, and uh, a way of getting at this is we all know who the Jesuits are, right? Do you know what, do you know what the word Jesuitical means? Uh, just a second, I, I looked it up just to make sure I, the Oxford Dictionary. So Jesuitical, deceitful, <laughs> dissembling equivocating, <laughs> hair-splitting, over-subtle. Okay. Now, and I like to share this with the Jesuits because we would all make the case that that's not a fair presentation of who we are. Pharisaical doesn't capture the Pharisees either, and I'm going to speak very in broad breaststrokes here, but the Pharisees, one way of appreciating the Pharisees were they're predominantly, and I'm using anachronistic language, predominantly a lay movement. There were some priests who were Pharisees, but the Pharisees took very seriously that the scripture, and particularly the Torah, the first five books of the Bible that, can, that it contained the commandments of God, um, which all Jews to this day consider still to be a great gift. It's the God-given uh, revelation of how they are to live as God's holy people. Uh, we tend to think of laws and obligations. Isn't it uh, wonderful to think of it in another way, that this God has revealed how we're to be uh, God's holy people? Well, many of those laws written you know, hundreds of years before Paul's time uh, pertain to issues that could be somewhat esoteric. Many of them pertain to the priestly cult. And if you're not a priest, how they don't seem to apply to you at all. Many of them. Uh, uh, apply to uh, agricultural practice. If you live in a city like Paul seemed to do, they don't seem to speak to you. But Pharisees like Paul were convinced that, no, this is God's word. It's God's revelation. It continues to speak that all of those commandments need to be interpreted for us in our context so that we can be faithful to, as God's uh, covenant people. This is the whole uh, thrust behind the oral tradition. Okay? But what I want to point out is, what's the commitment? Is to God's word is living, 
as gift. And there's a responsibility to study it and to walk in, the, in God's ways. And Jews have this wonderful uh, dynamism of study and living, study and, and, and living to this day. It's, it's something we can all imitate. Okay? Um, so this is, the, Paul identifies himself as a Pharisee. And he's, then he goes on to say, as uh, to the law, uh, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's a fairly robust self-assessment. He's not saying he was sinless, but he's saying, I was faithful to the law. And, and, and uh, Jews have ways, just like we have, Catholics have ways when we sin. There's, there's uh, uh, cultic celebrations, uh, cultic acts we do in repentance. But Paul says uh, elsewhere, I far exceeded my contemporaries in zeal for the Torah. And then he says, as to zeal for the law, a persecutor of the church. And that's what I think we need to wrestle with, to appreciate uh, what Paul was doing at the moment of um, the encounter with the risen Lord. Okay. First of all, when Paul talks about persecuting the church, he's talking about persecuting fellow Jews. But these were Jews who had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. Keep in mind that the first, what we would call the first Christians were you know, Jesus' disciples, Mary, the mother of God. They're all Jews, right? Okay. Um, so these are the folks that Paul is persecuting. Why would he persecute them? Because um, th let's think of the Gospels. What we know of the Gospels, um, the Pharisees and Jesus are always uh, debating things. Now, I want to be careful in saying this, that Jesus, there's no evidence Jesus was a Pharisee, but of all the groups that we know of from uh, the Jewish world at that time, whether we're talking about Essenes, uh, Zealots, uh, Sadducees, Pharisees, I would say Jesus is most akin with the Pharisees because notice what Jesus does in those conversations. It's really about how do we interpret God's law? What's right to do on the Sabbath? How do we come together to, to, uh, to eat? What's, um, these are really questions of what's God's will uh, through these commandments. And we know that Jesus um, interpreted the law in a different way in many respects. He seemed to relax some of the uh, Sabbath restrictions. He did things that others didn't think were appropriate on the Sabbath. Um, he wasn't, uh, at least his disciples didn't seem to uh, be as concerned with uh, some purity laws. Um, this could be problematic. Jesus seems to be, uh, you know, from a certain perspective, he plays a little fast and loose with some of this stuff. Also, we know from this time that uh, those who were really concerned with the law, the kind of the proto-rabbis, it was really important that you could um, make a case that, well, I come from this tradition of interpretation. So I was taught by, in Paul's case, Rabbi Gamaliel, one of the greats. Okay. Uh, who taught Jesus? Nobody. Maybe Mary and Joseph a little bit when he was younger. And why does, when Jesus gets questioned, why, by what authority do you say these things and do these things? Jesus seems to intimate that he's pretty closely connected to God, No. Well, put yourself in Paul's shoes and as a Pharisee, that can sound a little bit dangerous, right? And then we know that uh, Jesus was put to death, and he was put to death by crucifixion. Okay. There's a passage in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 21, 23, and, and keep in mind Deuteronomy is part of the Torah, those first five books, that says, cursed is anyone hanged on a tree. It's a text Paul alludes to in Galatians 3.13. And I think there he's kind of giving us a little bit of a window into his prior thinking. So you kind of add all this together that if we look at Jesus' actions from somebody who's very zealous to try to fulfill the law as carefully and as closely as one can, uh, who died a death that um, is cursed, by scripture, um, 
And now you have these fellow Jews who are saying remarkable things about him. He's God's Messiah. God's raised from the dead. He's Lord. Sounds blasphemous. Paul reacts in a way that we might not find um, the most helpful today, but it comes from a tradition. Uh, I don't know if you've read Numbers 25 recently, but you have the story of Phineas on the journey from uh, uh, Egypt into the, uh, toward the Holy Land. Moses was very concerned that the Israelites did not intermix with people, certainly no intermarriage. Why? Because you'll go, you'll abandon the God of Israel and worship other gods. And that's what happens in Numbers 25. Phineas sees this Israelite man with a Moabite woman worshiping Moabite gods. Phineas enacts uh, violence. Uh, First Kings 18, think of the story of Elijah and uh, the priests of Baal. Uh, Elijah ministering at a time when Ahab married Jezebel. <laughs> Jezebel, what does she do? She worships the Baals and leads Israel. And we have Elijah acting in zeal for the Lord, but it's a zeal that is also exercised through violence. Um, and close to the time of Jesus in 1 Maccabees, when the Greeks are imposing their ways on the Jews, and uh, Mattathias seeing one of the Jews willing to sacrifice uh, the Greek gods and eat pork, uh, Mattathias had a zeal for the Lord and acts violence. This is kind of this tradition. Um, so this is what Paul's, you know, actually the Apostles presents a pretty dramatic way that Paul persecuted church. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I, I th- my sense is Paul's, uh, what, Paul's persecution of fellow Jews who were Christ believers probably took the form certainly of harassment, uh, perhaps ostracizing, uh, boycotting, making life miserable, and perhaps even physical punishment. It's, it's very striking that in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul lists sufferings he's endured. He says, uh, five times I received 40 lashes minus one in the synagogue. Now, Paul didn't receive lashes in the synagogue as a Pharisee. He probably received 40 lashes minus one after his encounter with the risen Christ preaching, he probably had the same thing done to him that he may have either done himself or approved of of others. Just trying to give us a flavor of this. So this is what Paul is doing out of zeal for the Lord. These are misguided Jews. They're not doing, they're not believing properly, and they're misleading others. And it's in the course of that that uh, Paul encounters the risen Lord. Uh, I don't know why I got a kick out of that one on the left. It looks like the Superman Jesus. Um, (laughs) Uh, the one on the right is a little, actually, theologically, I think, better. But um, this is a momentous thing. Because think of Paul's assessment of Jesus. Uh, he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, we once knew Christ in a fleshly way, in an uninformed way. My sense is he thought of him as a, as a false messiah. He says we no longer know him so. Um, but it's because of this encounter with one who was not only um, alive, Paul thought, you know, um, according to the Acts of the Apostles, the risen Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Paul's not persecuting Jesus in his head. Jesus is dead. He's persecuting uh, misguided followers. But now Paul comes to appreciate that this Jesus is alive. And not only alive, raised from the dead, um, but in a different way than, let's say, Jairus' daughter or the the, uh, son of the widow of Nain or Lazarus. They were resuscitated, brought back to life, but they were to die. Jesus is alive in in a transcendent, eschatological way. Uh, Death no longer has power over him. And not only is he alive and risen, he's imbuing the very glory of God been vindicated by God, revealing himself as Lord. Okay. Now, I want to do kind of an imaginative exercise with you because when I think about this event and, and, and picture myself with Paul, who's uh, not, we have him knocked off another horse, um, think of Paul that night. 
What's going on in his head? I think he's got three options. One option would be, you know, it was a long, hot day. I've been working really hard. I probably need a vacation. Something very strange happened, I, but I, it, that couldn't have happened. No, Paul, that really wasn't an option for Paul because the experience was so real. It was the most real thing in his life. He couldn't deny the experience. He couldn't deny the encounter with one who was living and imbuing the glory of God. So the first option really wasn't an option. The second option, which ultimately won't be an option either, is the other extreme. Paul could ask himself, well, how could I have been so wrong? I've been studying the scripture my whole life. And look what it led me to do. So let's throw out the scripture. No, Paul can't do that because the scripture is the word of God. So the third option is the one he took, the one in the middle. Christ, the experience is real. Christ is raised from the dead, embodying the very glory of God. And the scripture is true. So what I would propose what Paul did over a course of time. This event happened anywhere, let's say, let's date it, 33, 34, 35, in that period, not that long after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The earliest extant letter we have from Paul is 1 Thessalonians, which most scholars date to around the year 51. So there's a significant period of time. One of the scholarly debates in Pauline circles is, did Paul's thought develop? Do you see development within the early writings, the later writings? My sense is not a whole lot. The development would have occurred before the writing. And what I propose is, is that this experience led Paul to um, rethink through a lot of things. Um, did you ever see the movie The Sixth Sense? You remember this is Bruce Willis, and he was uh, trying to help this little boy who saw dead people. And there's a really surprising ending uh, to the movie. And once you know the ending, it's interesting to go back and watch the movie again. And you see a sort of, all sorts of things you didn't notice before. Or a good mystery novel. Once you've read through it and you know the ending, you go back and read it and you see, oh, there's all these clues. My sense is that's how Paul treated the scripture. It's interesting when you look at his letters, um, he certainly refers to the law, but Moses becomes a little more ambiguous figure. Moses would have been the great hero, right, as the lawgiver. Um, and now Paul seems to get very interested in the story of Adam. And I'll talk about Adam in a second. The story of Abraham and the call of Abraham, to whom was given the promise that he would be the father of not only the Jews, but of the nations, of the Gentiles. The Jew plus Gentile family. Um, Deuteronomy and kind of coming into the land and, and, and the notion of new covenant from the, from the prophets. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, especially chapters 40 to 55, huge for Paul. And the Psalms, um, the suffice, uh, righteous sufferer. And I should go back to Isaiah, this notion of a suffering figure who bears the sins of many and through whom God brings life. I would suggest that in reflecting upon that experience with the risen Christ, that it led Paul to think of God and Christ and the spirit, life, spirit in new ways. So I just want to give a flavor of this. Um, in, in the letters of the Romans, uh, everyone agrees that there's kind of a thesis statement that's set forth in chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul's talking about the gospel. He's not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those gospels hadn't been written yet. For Paul, the gospel is a living word. It's what God has done through Christ and the sending of the Spirit. And in the very proclamation of it, it brings life to those who receive it. It's a performative word. Um, Paul says the gospel is the power of God for salvation. The dunamis, dynamite, it's explosive. And he says in the gospel, 
the revelation, I'm sorry, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Literally, the text says, out of faith, unto faith. Paul's not always real clear. But here, fortunately, that was chapter 1, verse 17. Three, uh, two chapters later, chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, uh, Paul uh, explains that. We had that reading in Mass today. Boy, I wish I could say I planned this. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, providential that that happened. I'm going to come to that passage in a second. Uh, but basically, in a nutshell, I, I pulled out a couple passages from Romans uh, where Paul we get a sense of what Paul is about here. He says, God demonstrates God's love toward us in that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul tends to write in a very clipped manner. Uh, he uses, you, got, you have to throw out a fancy word once in a while, enthymeme. You know what an enthymeme is? It's a syllogism that leaves one of the premises unstated so that the interlocutor, the hearers, can be empowered to fill in the blank and make the connection. Because at one level you say, how does Christ dying for us prove God's love? Okay. So there's some intermediary steps that you have to take. So elsewhere in the letter, Paul says, God shows his love for us and that God did not spare this, his own son. Chapter 8, verse 32. God holds nothing back in showing God's love. That which was most intimate. Uh, we know of John 3, 16, God so loved the world. You have that in Paul. Okay. How does Jesus' death then show forth God's love? Because Jesus doesn't go to the cross as a puppet, kicking and screaming, unwilling. As Paul says elsewhere, Christ loved us and gave his life for us. This was the expression of Christ's love. How much does Christ love us? Uh, God holds nothing back in sending the Son. Christ holds nothing back in showing his love. And did this when we were not only sinners, but if you look at verse 10 on the right, Paul says, well, we were enemies. Paul came to consider that his activity prior to the encounter with the risen Christ, he was actually acting unwittingly as an enemy of God, working against the gospel, against the spread of the gospel. Paul says, while I was God's enemy, God reached out to me and reconciled me. That's how much God loves us. Reconciliation usually takes two to come together, and it's usually the person who is um, hurt who has to make the first move. Paul says God's magnanimity is so great uh, that God is the one who uh, bridged, uh, built the bridge that we might have life again. Um, anyone in here read Greek? There's a few, I know. Father Rivers, where are you? I saw. Okay. <laughs> um, there's, a few, there's a few Greek readers. I have bad news for those of you who aren't. You know what, uh, from a Greek perspective, a barbarian is? Somebody who doesn't know Greek. <laughs> I'm with a bunch of barbarians tonight. Uh, so we're going to have just a little, little lesson here. Um, I want to come back to Romans 3.22, the righteousness of God. God's righteousness reveal, uh, refers, in a nutshell, uh, we can talk about this more in the Q&A, um, it really refers to God's covenant faithfulness. This is something Paul knew about from his early days studying the Jewish scripture. That's, this is how God is. God's righteousness reveal, uh, refers to an attribute of God and to the action that comes forth uh, from that attribute. God is a God of covenant. God wants to be in relationship. God initiates the relationship. What happens when Israel and God's people are unfaithful? God keeps coming back, offering uh, the covenant anew. Here he says that God's righteousness has been revealed. Uh, the NRSV text says, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Uh, the Common English Bible, which was a translation that just came out about six or seven years ago, says God's righteousness has been revealed through the faithfulness of Jesus for all who have faith. Okay? The phrase here is pistis, faith, uh, Christu, Christ. And the bit, easiest way I can explain this to you is uh, Greek is an inflected language. Not only are uh, verbs inflected, but nouns take different forms depending on how they function in, in the text. So if, it, if a noun is a subject of a sentence, it has one ending. If it's a direct object, another ending. Okay? 
Uh, and Greek can be pretty concise because you can put two nouns together and there's a relationship between them that can, gets expressed by a genitive case, okay? We have this in English, believe it or not. And the example I want to give you is the phrase love of God. There you have two nouns, love and God, okay? What does that mean, love of God? Well, it's ambiguous, right? If I say, the love of God is shown forth in that God sent his only son, your mind automatically interpreted that phrase as God's love, as God's love for us, right? But how about if I say, the love of God, or let's show forth the love of God by singing a song of praise. Now the phrase means our love for God, okay? So the phrase is ambiguous, and it's in its use that we figure out what it means. Pistis Christu, faith in Christ is ambiguous. And here you see two ways of rendering that. And I am of, uh, among a growing number of scholars who think that what Paul's talking about here, and I, we can talk about this in the Q&A uh, exegetically, uh, I could argue this better, but my sense is God's righteousness is revealed first and foremost through his sending Jesus, his son, the Messiah of Israel, uh, and through Jesus' faithfulness. Faithfulness to God and God's ways, faithful to showing forth God's love, which for Paul is focused in the act of Jesus giving his life on the cross. Uh, elsewhere, Paul talks about the obedience of Jesus. Okay. It's the faithfulness of Jesus who can reveal to us, because he in effect is the personal expression of God, God's very love for us. So Jesus reveals who God is, but also the flip side of Jesus is human. Jesus reveals what it means to be authentically a human. And this is another theme that Paul came to appreciate. And you can see this in, in Romans 5, uh, Jesus is the new Adam. I found this little uh, comparison on the right hand side. I, I liked it, except I wish, I'm not good with computers. All I can do is cut and paste these things. Uh, ignore the bottom entry on, on uh, he said, I realize I'm telling you to ignore it. You're looking at it now. But um, <laughs> that's, that's how these things go. But the first four characterizations, I think, capture very well uh, what, what Paul is about. Uh, Jesus not only reveals what, who God is, but he reveals what authentic human existence looks like, the new possibility. So Paul will say something in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.15 or 5.14, 5.15. He says, the love of Christ impels us. It's a driving force within us. Uh, we're convinced that one died for all, therefore all have died, so that those of us now living live no longer for ourselves. That's the old Adam way of living, grasping after life where it's not offered. Think of the story of Adam grasping after life, trying to exalt himself. Oh, you'll be like God, right? Um, and ultimately being disobedient to God, Christ, as he's presented in the hymn in uh, Philippians 2, Christ is not a grasper. He doesn't cling to his equality with God as something to be manipulated or clung to. He empties himself, lowers himself, uh, taking on human form to show the love of God and is obedient even unto death, death and a cross. Jesus is reversing the way of Adam and is setting forth a way of existence that's marked by obedience to God and God's ways. And to put it most simply, to reflect God's image and likeness, and Paul certainly believed that we're creating the image and likeness of God, is to grow in the way of self-giving love. That's what reveals God to others. That's how we become icons of God. But that's only possible through the gift of the Spirit. And one of the things that's um, clear through uh, Paul's writings and throughout the New Testament, actually the Apostles is the best example of this, early church uh, really experienced something dramatic and new with the outpouring of the Spirit. Really transformed people. Uh, think of the Apostles uh, cowering in fear, abandoning Jesus at his death, and then at the Pentecost, all of a sudden, not only speaking other languages, but they're on fire. They're courageous. They, they stand up to the religious authorities who are telling them to be quiet. So, no, we have to obey God and ultimately give their lives. This is a transforming spirit, and Paul took that spirit very, uh, very seriously. And the most sustained treatment of the Holy Spirit in the entire New Testament is found in the letter to the Romans in chapter 8. 
Uh, and there Paul says some beautiful things. He says the spirit that we receive is not a spirit of fear. It's a spirit of adoption. Uh, that God has adopted us as God's children, as sons and daughters. Um, crying out, I like that little picture on the right, Abba. Paul says this in, in Romans 8, 15 and in uh, Galatians 4, 6. You know where else that word appears? In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Abba, all things are possible with you, but not my will, your will be done. This is how Jesus prayed to God. This intimacy that Jesus had with his father is now an intimacy that we can share through the gift of the spirit. As the church fathers would put it, we become by adoption what Jesus is uh, by nature. And, and later in that chapter, Paul talks about how the spirit conforms us more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Uh, we take on, and Jesus who is described as the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. So Paul's talking about a family of faith. And it's the spirit that empowers us, enables us to take on more and more the family likeness. If you want to get a sense of what that is, and this is very practical for our spiritual lives, look at any of those virtue lists that Paul sets forth. For instance, in Colossians, put on compassion, kindness, forbearance, but most of all, over all these, put on love. Or look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. You get a word portrait of Jesus. There's nine qualities listed. Not fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit. Okay? It's not a smorgasbord. We get to pick and choose. Okay, today I went through the food line and I bypassed the salad because the pasta and soup look a lot better. Vegetables are, could be overrated in some ways of thinking of things. No, you've got to take there's no picking and choosing here. Growing in all these virtues, um, that's becoming more Christ-like. And the Spirit empowers that. But I want to be very clear that for Paul, while individual growth is essential, Paul, like the whole uh, biblical outlook, is more concerned with formation of communities. And I'm going to close with this. Because I think, my friends, this is a message, an understanding of church. It's an understanding of our spirituality that is the most important thing we have to share with the world today. If you ask yourself this question, and if we, if we could ask Paul, I, um, to my knowledge, uh, we don't have any record of anyone asking Paul and he's answering this, but here's what I think Paul would answer to this question. Ask yourself this question. We believe that Christ's death and resurrection has changed the world, the outpouring of the Spirit. Now we live 2,000 years after that, those events. Has the world really changed? Has it really made a difference? Well, if the answer is no, we're in big trouble. We've been wasting our time. But you have to ask yourselves, or we shouldn't, I shouldn't tell you what you have to do anything, but I, I would invite us to ask ourselves, um, how does it make a difference? And my sense is, if you ask Paul, give us proof that what you proclaimed happened. I think Paul would say what he's trying to get the Corinthians and the Romans to do, that you bring together that the spirit of Christ, when people say yes to the gospel, open their hearts to the outpouring of the spirit, receive God's mercy, and allow the spirit to transform them. Um, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, Rich and poor, men and women. Think of all the ways that human, humanity gets divided, socioeconomic, um, uh, ethnic, religious, cultural, gender differences, all these ways that we get divided. But Paul says in Galatians 3.28, 3, uh, in Christ, there's no longer may, uh, slave or free, Jew or Greek, male or female. He's not saying that these differences have been obliterated. What he's saying is the way these differences tend to put wedges between people can be overcome. And Paul's very passionate about people coming together as brothers and sisters, and not only as brothers and sisters and regarding and really treating themselves, one another, 
communities of faith as brothers and sisters, but as brothers and sisters for whom Christ died. So this whole argument, for instance, in, in uh, Corinth, can we eat meat sacrificed to idols? Paul goes for three chapters on this. It's, it's, it's a live question. But at the end of the day, Paul says to those who are arguing, we, we can. There's no gods. They're, 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 those are idols. They're false gods. They don't believe that stuff. Paul basically says, can't you give up a steak for the sake of a brother or sister for whom Christ gave his life? The church at its best is diversity that forms itself around the nucleus of Christ, that expresses the unity and diversity. And if you want to get a sense of this, I'd invite you to look at Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul basically says the, the, the uh, vocation of the church is to show forth to the whole world a different way of being, uh, a being marked by love. Could you say something about the relationship with, between Paul and James? Paul and James, yes. So James of, uh, of Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. Um, and are you referring specifically to uh, Galatians 2 and you know, the Acts of the Apostles 15? So I, I just want to make sure I have the... Yeah. So... Um, yeah, so the question here is the relationship between uh, Paul and, and James. And um, in Galatians 2, Paul refers to an event that we also have recorded in Acts 15. Uh, and the question, and Galatians is a good example of this, uh, Paul is the one who brought the gospel to Galatia. Uh, which is kind of in the middle of what's present-day Turkey. Um, the Galatians, from what we can tell, it was an entirely Gentile uh, group that formed this church. And Paul presented the gospel to them. And then after Paul left, another group of missionaries came. And they basically said, you know, Paul gave you a kind of a, a, a cheapened, storefront version of the gospel because um, to be part of the people of God, and this actually makes sense in the tradition, is in effect you have to become Jewish. And so the men be circumcised and to um, obey the, the, the Torah more um, stringently than, than Paul seems to have set forth. And so the, the question really comes down to these Gentiles who seem to be uh, in, in larger numbers than, the, than Jews receiving the gospel, how do we incorporate them into this new entity? This, and, you know, we have to keep in mind that early on there wasn't, you know, the church and Judaism had not, the, the definitive split had not occurred yet. So... Uh, the categories are, are, are somewhat mixed. So how do, you, how do the Jews get incorporated, or Gentiles get incorporated into this people? And according to the Acts of the Apostles and uh, Paul, that Paul and Barnabas, uh, Bar Barnabas uh, and Paul worked together in the Gentile mission. Um, they came into Jerusalem, and the leaders of the Jerusalem church were uh, Peter, James and John. J not James, son of Zebedee. This is another James, the, probably the author of the letter of James. Okay. The, the names, <laughs> it gets a little confusing here. James is apparently the real leader of the Jerusalem church. And he seems to be of a, a mind, of, and keep in mind the Jerusalem church would be all Jews. Okay. So according to Paul and the Acts of the Apostles, um, there was an agreement that the, Jew, that the Gentiles did not need to be circumcised. Now, here's an interesting thing. If you read Paul's version of the, the event, and he brought along Titus, who was a Gentile convert. And Titus was kind of brought along as an exhibit of, look what the Spirit can do. You know, he, he, he was brought as a faithful uh, Christ believer. Um, and he was not made to be circumcised. And so Paul left that conference thinking basically the question had been settled. Okay. Um, 
Read the Acts of the Apostles. It's interesting. They, according to Luke, the author of Acts, Gentiles didn't need to be circumcised, but there were some concessions made to the Jewish believers pertaining to kosher food, right? And idols, okay? And in a certain respect, that made sense. How do you bring people together at table? But according to, to Paul, that was not part of the agreement. And later on, Peter is eating with the Gentiles, believers, and then people from James come. Now, this is where we have to be careful. Did James really send them? Okay, The people who claimed to be sent by James rebuked and reproved Peter. It says, you shouldn't be eating with the Gentiles. You're eating unclean food. And Peter withdrew table fellowship, as did everyone else. And one of the saddest lines in, in Paul is, even Barnabas left. You know, it, um, so the issue seems to be how, how Jewish do the Gentiles have to become? And, and I think what Paul, you know, it, there's debates on how much Paul himself, you know, when Paul says, when I'm among Gentiles, I'm as a Gentile, but with Jews, I'm a Jew. Uh, he's kind of the Paul the amoeba, you know, he kind of can form himself, all things to all people, he says, but to bring them Christ. It, my sense is that what Paul learned at, at, at Antioch, which is what this, where the, where Gentiles and, and Jews really came together in the same community. This is where some of these conflicts came into being. Um, I think what Paul came to appreciate was that anything that, in his mind, got put Christ somehow to the side is something he's not interested in. And what I mean by that is, you know, the, this concern for kosher food laws, and, 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 and they're important, and they're a way to bring people together. But if that starts becoming the trump card, and somehow Christ isn't part of this, um, for Paul, that now becomes something that he wants to set aside. But this is what, you know, Paul is a very controversial figure. And you read the end of the Acts of the Apostles, and what's he accused of when he comes to Jerusalem? He's teaching people to disobey our, our law. So what we have early on is a real grappling with um, the status of the law and specific commandments vis-a-vis -vis the gospel. And Paul ultimately was a person who said, uh, for freedom Christ set us free. Um, but, you know, I want to be very careful in talking about this because it can be very easy to say, well, that's just legalism. How did they really? No, it wasn't legalism. These were very important questions. How do you bring people together to eat and to worship? What days to worship? They're very important questions. And, you know, I sympathize with those who say, you know, Paul seems to be a renegade. He's throwing everything out. Uh, Paul's position ultimately won, and it's a position that we've inherited. But I'm, you know, I'm sympathetic to the other side of it. Now, did James... Was James, were James and Paul opposed? I don't think so. Um, it's interesting, the letter of James, where, Paul, uh, where it says, show me work or faith without works. And people will use that to say, well, Paul is about faith and not works. No, that's not true at all. Uh, Paul uh, opposes faith, the, I would say the faithfulness of Christ, with works of law, specifically circumcision, Sabbath observance and food laws, uh, which mark Jews out as Jews. Paul says, no, that's not how God's working. Okay, But Paul says, what is faith? Faith works itself out through love. It, uh, er, uh, ergo nama, it, 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 you have to have works with faith. Okay? So I'm not sure that was kind of a long answer to your question, but did, did I get to what you were wanting? Okay, good. Please, sir. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Sister Jim. Could you say something about... Sister, uh, I'm sorry. Sister Jim William, could you wait just a second? Oh. Yes, uh, okay. well, could you say yeah. something why Martin Luther was so fascinated by the letter to the Romans, which well, led to it, the it, Reformation? Yeah, I think the, the real letter for uh, Martin Luther was Galatians. Um, and that, the, the freedom. Um, 
And I think what Luther was attracted to was in that letter, Paul's so passionate about the centrality of Christ and um, he's trying to get the Galatians to see that these other things are somehow, they're, they're, they're getting caught up in other concerns that Christ is being set aside. Now you might ask yourself, these Galatians who are Gentiles, why would, they want to, why would these men want to be circumcised? Especially after they'd already been baptized. But think of new converts. You know how converts really are, they're more zealous than the rest of us. The, more is the merrier. And, and Paul is concerned there that somehow these rival missionaries have, they're, they're, they're distracting the Galatians from the centrality of Christ. They're getting caught up and wondering about, you know, food laws and do this and that. And Paul says, centrality of Christ, for freedom Christ has set us free. We can focus solely on Christ. And Luther, um, who was looking at some of the practices of the Catholic Church, which seemed to be, you know, whether it's, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, somebody help me, the uh, indulgences, thank you, uh, indulgences, saying this and, and, and all the practice that went behind that and the concern and the emphasis saying, you know, where's Christ in this, right? So my sense is it was, Galatians is the charter of Christian freedom. And I think Martin Luther read that and saw the centrality of Christ and felt as if he had been, that was kind of his Damascus experience, if I can put it that way. He had, a, he had an experience of Christ through that letter that was very freeing for him. Uh, Jim Buim. Okay. Um, Father Stegman, I have been wrestling with um, Paul's understanding of the death of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as a revelation of God's justice and love mm -hmm. with um, the con a contemporary theology mm -hmm. that sees the death of Jesus as not willed by God mm -hmm. and rather as a consequence of the injustice and the wickedness of Roman imperial power. Yep. How do we reconcile these two perspectives? Jim Williams, my student. <laughs> I'm directing your STL thesis. Um, and these are the kind of questions I get all the time. So the question is, for those who, who didn't hear it, no, this is an excellent question. So how do we, uh, you know, I'm claiming that the, the cross is the revelation of God's love and righteousness and justice. That justice is kind of encapsulated in the word righteous, righteousness with contemporary understandings of, well, Jesus was put to, get, uh, put to death unjustly. The Romans, the imperial powers, what put him to death. Um, the killing of an innocent man, right? So how do you reconcile these? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think Paul himself, or uh, from what I can see, any of the uh, early Christians looked at what happened to Jesus as historians might today who would construe the death of Jesus as, you know, just this uh, total act of uh, injustice um, by the Romans. Okay. We have to appreciate that the biblical perspective is that anything that happened, especially happened with Jesus, is somehow God's will. Okay. Uh, now, here's how I would get at this from a contemporary vantage point. And this is Tom talking, right? Not the Lord. <laughs> You know where Paul at one point says, "This is Paul. This is my th thing, not not the Lord's. This is this is my wrestling with this this question." I think one can say, from a biblical perspective, especially from a Pauline and a Joanine from jo a Joanine perspective, Jesus' primary vocation as God's Son become flesh is to reveal the love of God. So in the Gospels, the canonical Gospels, we see this played out in Jesus' teaching, 
feeding, healing, reconciling, the way he reaches to those who are poor and marginalized. Those are all ways of revealing God, what God wants in inaugurating the reign of God in which there's wholeness and life with God in community. Okay? Now notice when Jesus does that, that does evoke opposition because that's not something that there's forces in the world don't, that don't like that, right? Whether it's political power or religious authority, okay? So Jesus being faithful to that mission of revealing God's love ran into opposition. In my own sense, there comes a certain point in time where Jesus saw where this was going. Certainly the death of John the Baptist made that clear to him. Why did John the Baptist get put to death? He was faithful to what God asked him to do. Preach repentance. He told Herod to repent. Had him put to death. Um, so at a certain point, I think Jesus embraces the, the cross. Um, now, the night before he dies, he's presented in Mark's gospel, Lord, take this, Father, take this cup from me if it's possible, but not my will, your will be done. Um, so the cross, at that level, from, from a human historical level, yeah, it was a great injustice done. But what gets revealed is that in this is that, first of all, the story doesn't end on Good Friday, Right? It continues into good uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, Jesus' resurrection, I think, is best understood as God's vindicating what Jesus revealed. In his entire life and ministry, and particularly on the cross, God doesn't let the story end with Jesus' death. And, and God, this is our belief in the Paschal mystery, God is a God of, who's a creator, is a God of life. And God can bring life out of death grace out of sin, joy out of sorrow, all these things, okay? Um, so I would say, you know, trying to kind of reconcile this, yeah, you could say, yeah, from a human perspective, Christ suffered a great injustice and he was put to death for bad reasons. Did God really want that for Jesus? I don't know if God wanted that. I do know that God wanted Jesus to reveal God's love and this and because love is an offer, love is, itself is not violent, love is an invitation, okay? Um, it's not, it can't be forced upon people. It was rejected by some. Uh, but notice what the cross reveals. Jesus doesn't ever fight back, right? In effect, what I think we say the cross absorbed the worst that humanity can inflict on humanity absorbed it, you know, because violence begets violence. Here's where it can stop. It did stop. And those of us who are called to be Christ followers are to participate in that dynamism so that violence continues to stop. So that's, that's how I'd make sense of it. And I'm going beyond, you know, Paul's text. I mean, I think your question is, is a great question. I don't think it's a question Paul wrestled with. But I think it's one we have to wrestle with. And that's how I think about it. But that's one person's construal. Nico. Uh, thank you, Father Tom. Um, I just have a question about Paul's um, experience of encountering Christ. And you made mention of that when you said that um, his experience was so real that he could not deny it. Um, I suppose my question is, how best do you think we should talk about that experience because um, in Galatians 1, uh, 15 and 16, he mentions about this, uh, God revealing the Son in me right. rather than to me. Yeah. So was that a profound spiritual experience or was it uh, an objective vision or was it something else? Yeah, yeah. I think it's both and. Uh, so uh, Nikos, uh, I've made a big deal about Paul encountered somebody who was alive. Right? Two subjects encountering one another. In Galatians uh, chapter 1, verses 11 to 16, Paul talks about, that. refers to this event. So at first he says, um, 
he's talking about the gospel. He didn't receive it from any human being, he, uh, nor was he tied. He says, it came to me through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is one of those ambiguous things. <laughs> is it a revelation about Christ? Is it Christ's revelation of himself? Um, because he says elsewhere, for instance, in 1 Corinthians uh, 9.1, or in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, he insists he has seen the Lord, just as Peter and, the, and James and the other dis, uh, apostles saw the Lord. Uh, and, and Luke insists upon this in the Acts of Apostles. I, I take that, that seriously, but then you, you point us to a text in which Paul says, God was pleased to reveal his son, uh, en et moi, in me. And... So I take this as, yes, there was an encounter with, with, with Christ that happened at a particular time, particular place, but it was a gift, a revelation that continued. In, in some respects, I think one could say it was, a, it was a mystical experience, too, an ongoing mystical experience. And Paul elsewhere will talk about the type of experiences he's had in prayer, right? So I think it's both and. Um, again, I, I come back to that. What's always struck me, and, and people rarely avert to this, um, the event of the encounter with Christ, I would date somewhere in the mid-30s. We don't have anything from Paul till 51. That's 15, 16 years. Now, the Acts of the Apostles talks about some of his activity. Um, but my sense is, well, that was a one-off event that changed Paul's life around it wasn't his last encounter with the living Lord. Okay, I, I would also just make the comment, and, and this could get me into a little trouble, but I think it's really important for us to reflect theologically. Um, what's the role of experience in God's ongoing revelation? We have texts, right? So this gets a little bit to your question about tradition and new experience, because the Gentile question, should they be circumcised? The whole tradition would say, yes, they should be circumcised because that's what it means to be part of the people of God. That's how you mark yourself as part of the people of God. And yet, the experience of people like Titus and others, the church was led the, to another way, right? Um, I think it's an ongoing question for many of the issues today. People's experience, and it's tricky. And Paul ran into this himself. You know, Paul claimed he saw the risen Lord well, how can you prove that? And you can easily imagine some people say, well, he, this is, you know, he basically has given himself a degree. Right? Paul says, I don't need any credentials. I've seen the Lord. Right? Um, so experience can be tricky, but it has to be discerned in the community. And that's, I guess, the point I would invite us to consider is I think we need to continue to listen to people's experiences today and discern them in light of the Spirit, because my, old, my teacher, Luke Johnson, always used to say, the Spirit is always moving in front of us. The tradition helps us kind of know where we're coming from and what direction we're going, but the Spirit is leading us. And uh, part of the way the Spirit works is through the lives of folks, believe it or not, folks like you and me. Oh. So, good. Last question. Uh, Father Rivers, I was thinking, is this the complaint? No. I just have a little question. Um, you know, many people read Paul through the Luke, Luke's stories, mm -hmm. but we don't have anything in there uh, directly in the story of Paul. Okay. We have his letters, to be sure. How do you feel about uh, Murphy O'Connor's uh, Paul, uh, Paul's history, attempting to put Luke and the letters together in a, a book that, that uh, puts it together. It's quite interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I like your, Jerome Murphy O'Connor is a, a great Pauline scholar, Dominican. Uh, we, we love Dominicans, right? Um, <laughs> just which, uh, we can get along. He was a big man who had big opinions, and his confidence in his opinions was as big as he was. He was a real strong personality. So the question that Father Rivers ra raises is, we have 13 letters attributed to Paul, and then we have in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, basically 16 chapters. You know, the Acts of the Apostles is the longest book of the New Testament, uh, describing Paul and his ministry. Not so much um, 
Well, we, we get speeches by Paul, but Paul's, the speeches from Paul sound like the speeches of Peter. I mean, that's one of Luke's points, right, that the early church is speaking in one voice. So the question becomes, how do you take these two sources because uh, Paul doesn't tell us much about himself. Luke tells us a lot about Paul. So how do you use these two sources to reconstruct Paul, his life, his teachings? Um, some would say Luke is of no good to us. Um, you go to the horse's mouth. You go to a first-hand account. Luke's is a second-hand account. Um, I think what Murphy O'Connor does, and, and, and I'm sympathetic to this, is there's obviously differences, um, but there are places and it's particularly true in Acts of the Apostles 18 through 19. I'm sorry, 16 through 19, where um, Luke is describing Paul's entrance into the European arena. So Greece, um, Philippi, Thessalonica, then Athens, Corinth, then Ephesus. Um, and he describes those things in great detail. And then when you read 1 Thessalonians, and 1 Corinthians, and Philippians, the data lines up pretty well. So my point would be, Luke's got his own theological agenda. There's no doubt about that. But I think Luke is more trustworthy than some of the skeptics would have us believe, that Luke is so entrenched in his theological vision, we can't really trust what he says as history. Where the two overlap, there's significant agreement, which gives me confidence that where there, you know, Luke's filling in other details, we can trust him there too. So, but you should know, or people should know that not everyone would agree with that. Some would say, if you want to know about Paul, just go to his letters. Of course, that raises the question, what letters come from Paul? <laughs> uh, so the last thing I would say is, do you, and I was telling uh, Father uh, Dick Roos this uh, beforehand, we we're talking about um, that image of the, uh, of, um, the handwriting. Problem. Do you know who wrote the letter to the Romans? You can't say Dick, because I told you. This is the one letter that we have that we know who wrote the letter. Does anyone know? We'll, we'll, we give a door prize. It's interesting, at the end of Paul's letters, he often sends greetings to people on the other side. And then he says, and my people here send greetings, you know, Luke. And um, so an interesting thing happens in chapter 16, verses either 22 or 23. So he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sassipater, my kinsfolk, fellow Jews. Then all of a sudden it says, I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. He's the secretary. It's just like, wait a minute, I'm going to say hi, too. And I got the pen. I got to say this. <laughs> Tertius wrote the letter to the Romans. Literally. Paul is the author because he dictated it. And with that, let's call it a night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.